Welcome everyone to the webinar of Think and Think Tank Alter Contacts. Today we have a wonderful speaker, Anir Mansen, who will introduce himself and will do the rest of the work. Thanks, Julia. That was a quick introduction, um, <laughs> and uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess uh, this has kind of become the the new norm of um, having these sort of meetings remotely, virtually. You know, I see everybody's uh, on their own in their rooms um, and uh, maintaining a social distance, uh, but that should not stop us from sharing our ideas. And I think this was one of those ideas where uh, it just uh, uh, just sprouted from a, a discussion like this and saying, hey, you know what, maybe we can start sharing some of our uh, ideas, some of our experiences through this sort of a platform. So uh, yeah, we'll get started with that. So first of all, you know, a bit of a background here. I'm not going to read through all of it. Uh, I will share the deck, so it will give you some ideas. But essentially, a couple of things here. First is, I've now so far in the last 25 odd years, more than 25 odd years, I've attended more than 100 events uh, and chaired a large number of them as well as participated in panel discussions. Uh, and um, this allows me, I guess, to uh, share some perspectives on, on what do people look for when they invite speakers? And then from the speaker's perspective, what would people um, need to do in order to get prepared uh, as speakers? Um, from a background perspective, have been involved in the business transformation uh, world, mergers and acquisitions, organization transformation, Lean Six Sigma and all of that stuff, uh, work with some of the larger companies, uh, work with some of the larger companies as well, and then advise uh, uh, all section of companies, large companies, small companies, mid-size, have worked across the globe. So that also gives me a good cultural insights on how different um, uh, companies, different countries, uh, different people operate across the globe and uh, and right now I, I run two businesses one is fifth chrome which is an advisory and training company and the other one is um, uh, roundtable insights that we conduct events um, on a monthly basis um, pick up very very um, hot topics relevant to the local crowd as well as which has got a global sort of impact or global angle to it um, so so that's kind of a bit of a background here um, but before we get started, I just wanted to get through some chat um, input. Uh, what's your compelling reason to become a speaker? You know, uh, I would like to hear from from the people in the audience. Um, what's your reason? Uh, of course, first to take the training, but more importantly, why do you want to be a speaker? You know, so let's use the chat button and see some responses here. I managed to reschedule my meeting, delighted to be here. Oh, sorry, this was from earlier, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't figure out that's the reason for uh, uh, to be a speaker. So yeah, type in your suggestions. Uh, let's see, establish our authority on the matter of CSR and SDGs. Uh, is storyteller for, uh, story mission is a speaker, so storyteller for the world. Shared experiences would be reason, okay. Inspire. Uh, share what I've learned. Okay, anything, anything else? Anybody else? Okay. I like to get people enthusiastic about what I find important. Topic in the world, I'm much better at bringing my messages across speaking than writing. I've been told I can inspire people, so I want to share my experience. Recognition, spread my message with more impact, yep. Okay, anybody else? Good. Okay, cool. So uh, I guess uh, we've got quite a good number of reasons. Now let's look at what does the, what is the industry saying about these, uh, uh, about these, uh, about the reasons, okay? So I think some of you have already mentioned, <laughs> Um, which is recognition, well, that's, that's, yes, that's one of the main reasons why 
people wanted to become a speaker, uh, leave a legacy. And I think some one of you kind of alluded to this point, uh, be able to influence. Uh, there's also the personal satisfaction, elation. Um, you get known, so you create a, a, a network. And then some people do it just as part of growing their business. And I think uh, your messages are quite similar to the ones that are mentioned here. Excellent. Good. So with that, uh, let's get started. So the first one is going to be, let's get some perspectives, right? So first, I want to give a perspective of audience. What does or what do audience look for when it comes to um, uh, speaking at these these events? You know, the speakers, when they look at speakers. And by the way, when I, when I am sharing this, uh, the thing that I want to mention is this is primarily driven from uh, professional conferences, seminars, events, uh, not necessarily uh, including TED Talks or TED uh, kind of events, but more general industry events specific to certain topics. So, and I clearly see a distinction uh, between the two. Um, in Alter Contacts, we've had the privilege of uh, hearing or uh, listening to Danny uh, a few weeks back, um, her perspective. Um, was uh, was including the TEDx and the TED Talks kind of thing. Mine is more to do with professional conferences, seminars, and events. Okay. So the first one, let's talk about first thing that audience looks for is expertise. Okay. Um, the person who's speaking must be an authority and be able to speak with uh, certain confidence okay so this would include industry expertise uh, one could talk about a certain methodology and this could be methodologies like in the past lean six sigma or ford's eight steps or um, uh, off late it's been agile and scrum or it could be any other methodology uh, design thinking that people may be uh, using um, the third one is it could also be functional in nature. So people may talk about HR or they may talk about supply chain um, or they may talk about certain other things. And then the other thing, of course, is geography. So this is, again, you know, people may talk about certain sort of trades or uh, uh, certain geographies, certain geolocations uh, that uh, people talk about. Uh, let's see. There was some chats are going on, so I'm just uh, looking at that. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so that kind of comprises or makes up the expertise of an individual. So when audience uh, would look at a speaker, they kind of expect certain level of authority, certain level of expertise there. The next one is uh, thought leadership. Okay. And this is extremely important because um, and that's where the difference comes in between uh, speaking with your colleagues in an in in-house meeting versus uh, talking in open forums. You know, there is a certain expectation about thought leadership. People not only want to hear about your opinion, but they also would want to hear about, um, sorry, not only hear about the expertise about the subject, but also would like to hear about some opinions. And this is where we talk about original ideas, fresh perspectives, opinions, bold views, and that's important, and influential thoughts. Thoughts that will or may create an impact or an influence in the way uh, you operate. Okay, so that's the second perspective, which is thought leadership. The third, and I think this is where a lot of people miss out on, is especially with senior managers in many companies, they believe just because they have, um, they have uh, seniority, that they have experience, that by default they'll be able to become good speakers? Uh, the answer is not. I've seen so many senior managers get on stage in front of 200, 300 people, uh, and when this, the mo minute they start talking, uh, they kind of start losing attention within the five minutes. And this could be because uh, there is too much of text on the screen, or it is the person is reading line by line, um, or the content itself is very dry and it becomes very monotonous um, uh, for the audience. And this is something uh, that uh, I wish more and more speakers would uh, take into consideration uh, and look at. So good story. It has to have a smooth flow 
and then it should have aesthetics. You know, the, it should be pleasing to see. If you're using a dry text, then keep the sentences short. If you're using photographs, then make sure that the photographs are appealing and relevant. Along with that comes in great oration, you know, uh, and this is something that uh, I find um, some people are good at, a large number of them people kind of struggle on, on oration, you know, how to tell your story in a compelling fashion on the stage in fr front of an audience. Um, it needs art, it needs also modulation. Uh, Danny spoke about uh, pauses, you know. So people need to make sure that the oration is there. It is, uh, you know, in many cases, people should at least visually in their minds practice it out, if not in physical sense. You know, some people like to create scripts, other people like to sort of uh, speak as, as they go along through kind of a discovery, a pantser kind of a method. Um, witty, um, you know, um, I, I, I say this is where I guess the difference between good speakers and great speakers, you know, uh, I have not seen great speakers who are not witty or have not used a certain element of fun or which in their own speech, you know, whether it's a serious speech or otherwise, they always use some form of which in there. Now, obviously, uh, we have to keep in mind that um, uh, what kind of environment are you are you talking about um, in case of a very serious environment instead of which you may apply some anecdotes some personal experience that find people may find interesting so which and interesting thoughts you know, kind of interchangeably be used okay but most importantly thought provoking you need to make sure that people who have attended your session are able to take back certain things with them. You know, there should be certain elements that make them question the conventional way of thinking, that make them question about the function or the speech that they talked about. So, so that's the kind of thing that one needs to keep in mind when it comes to uh, what content. Good content needs uh, a lot of these elements put together. Okay, and then the last but not least is concept adoption. Your concept, your method, your ideas that you talk about must have some sort of a proof, okay? It could be an accepted method. It, there should be some success stories. And most importantly, um, you know, if you have a business endorsement, i.e. some corporate or some companies, businesses have started using it, that adds a lot of mileage to what you're saying. Now, having said this, I mean, there is always a first or a starting point for a new idea, you know, so those, those things are always there. But in, in majority of these cases, when people are speaking on the stage, they are already using or they're talking about, they're referring to something that somebody somewhere has already used and can be endorsed. So that's, that's important. So this collectively kind of makes what the audience is looking for, okay? Now, before I move forward, I'm just going to pause here and see if there are any questions or reflections here. So please use the chat uh, to type in your questions or uh, even use uh, the audio. Um, Julia, can people use audio to uh, say or ask questions? Yeah, absolutely. And I was just thinking that it takes me quite a long time to type. Yes. And it, it, it seems to be a bit driving for me. Um, I do have a question, actually. You mentioned the expertise and yeah. uh, the industry experience and things like that. And what I notice often is that unless I have a brand name of some really big company, uh, the event organizers are not so keen on, you know, on inviting the speaker sure sure can i hold off to your question uh for another couple of slides absolutely yeah yeah um, okay i i do have a question though <clears throat> yeah because of course method success stories and business endorsement um where is the limit between using it as a legitimation of what you're saying and what you're doing and or becoming an advertisement yeah, 
Um, I think that's a great question, Masimo. Um, so, so the thing is, and maybe uh, you know, it kind of uh, also is something that I'll be talking about um, in the next uh, uh, couple of slides. Um, so, yeah. So let me do that. You know, um, uh, which is when we talk about the limits and the um, uh, as well as to Julia's question. Uh, the next couple of slides would talk about certain things that may partly or fully answer your questions, and then I'll, I'll take that question again, okay? Anybody else um, apart from those two questions? Okay, so in that case, uh, I will move, now move on and uh, go to the next, you know. So in the last section, we spoke about the audience perspective, okay? Now let me talk about the event producer's perspective because somebody who's organized this conference, this event, also needs to look at the revenue generation uh, perspective along with the, the great content. And the reality is that in order to have a successful event, you also need to have sponsorship. Okay, and this is where, to reflect on Massimo's question, this is where sometimes um, the quality of speakers do get compromised. And, and part of the reason is because as a sponsor, um, people or the companies feel, um, so yes, as a sponsor, you can show your where, uh, or you can show your expertise or your case studies or whatever to the audience but there is a sense of entitlement that gets to the sponsors. They often, they often compromise on the quality of speech to be given compared to the sales part of things. You know, and that kind of creates uh, uh, an imbalance of when it comes to the real quality of good speech. So, which is why if you are a sponsor, uh, as we say, if you're a sponsor, you could pretty much get away with anything, but, the thing is, if you want to be invited as a speaker again without a sponsor backing you up, you're likely not to be invited. Okay, and that's the key difference I want to I want to highlight here, which is from an events perspective, events do need sponsors. They do need the revenue coming in, and in a lot of cases, exclude sponsorship, and therefore they will have to. Uh, put in placeholders. They ha will have to promote certain speakers because they are sponsors. Um, from from this event, from this uh, uh, particular session, uh, we are talking about how to be invited as a speaker um, and and at least have certain quality about it. So so that's uh, on the sponsorship pitch. Now let's do some reality check. Okay, how to get invited as a professional speaker? The reality is that unless you have a big endorsement, i.e. a company backing you up, like, you know, for example, um, uh, Massimo, you work with Axon Noble, I worked with General Electric, um, and, uh, you know, there may be others who have worked with other big companies. Um, we would, at, time, at one point in time, we would get invited because of our brand name that we were carrying, you know, that we were part of uh, big companies. And we could be, uh, you know, we would get invited without necessarily the content um, uh, finesse, if I may say. But what, what I observed was uh, during my GE days, um, when I would get invited as a speaker, I also saw there were certain other people who also got invited as a speaker from GE. But um, over a period of time, they started being invited less and less because they were not as impactful. And I got, I guess, more invitations to the speakers. So anyways, coming back to the reality check, you must be one of these. Represent a marquee company, a big company, because the brand names of these big companies, when you see on an event brochure, it sells. And that's the reality, okay? Or you are a recognized expert. You know, and some of us who are uh, here today um, can get invited because the industry knows us as a recognized expert in, in, in our fields of expertise, you know? Or you're a thought leader, and thought leader would be essentially um, you have opinion about certain things. Um, you are seen as somebody who creates influencing ideas, and 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 there are things that you can 
share with broader teams. You can share your thought provocations with other people, etc. So you have to be a thought leader, or you're a good orator. You know, I have seen some people who who get um, invited because they are absolutely brilliant on the stage. You know, they absolutely they, they don't even need slides. They just can just get onto the stage and mesmerize the crowd because they're absolutely brilliant orators. They use voice modulation. They use theatrical uh, on stage uh, to make it absolutely, um, you know, mesmerizing, absolutely attractive. Or on the other side, you pay for your speaking slot. Okay. And this is where you can be invited as a speaker. If you pay a few grand, you get invited um, as, as a, uh, as a speaker, you know, and um, many of us, including I, in, in my initial days, I did pay for getting uh, invitations as a speaker, you know, just to get the ball rolling. OK, so this is, in general, the reality of the world, you know, which is why if you want to be invited as a speaker, you have to be one of these five um, in most of the cases. OK, unless you're you're related to the the uh, cousin of the organizer or whatever you know there they may be certain things but in general these are the uh, five uh, you know pieces or five types on based on which you can be invited to an event okay um, just um, um, another pause here um, i'm going to ask julia as well as uh, massimo um, does it answer your question partly well, um, it makes a lot of sense. It's very interesting to see. Um, I think it does provide an alternative to being a representative of a brand. Uh, but then I have a follow up questions. For example, uh, how do you become recognized as a thought leader? <laughs> do you write a book or, you know, but I'm sure it's something like that will follow. So I'll let you, I'll let you do. Sure, and that's the next part of the session. I'm just setting the stage here, and now we will move to the next stage, yeah? Excellent. Okay, cool. So, how? unfortunately, there are no shortcuts, as I'd said uh, in the previous page. You have to be one of those five if you want to be invited as a speaker. Now, um, if somebody has money, they obviously can pay their way through, but otherwise, how do you how do you develop yourself to be a thought leader or to be a recognized industry expert? And, and now I'm going to take you through a, a five stage, simple to understand five stages on how or, or following which you can become a, um, a recognized um, speaker. You can get invited repeatedly um, as, as being a recognized speaker. Okay. So where do I start? First thing is, it is building you brand, i.e. it is all about you and how do you build your brand? It is not just about the content or the ability uh, of oration or uh, the um, industry or the geography. It all centers around you. And so I'm going to take you through a five step process um, which centers around creating a brand around you as a speaker. OK. First one, drawing a line in the sand. Okay, what, what do I mean by that? Choose a topic that you're passionate about. Remember, one of the things about good versus great speakers is great speakers usually are very passionate about the topic they want to speak about, okay? Without passion, uh, you, you'll find it extremely difficult to become a good speaker. I'll give you a reason why that happens. When we create content for conferences or events, you know, um, and when we get invited, um, majority of the times we would get given certain set of uh, topics from which to choose from based on the area of expertise, right? Not all the time can we reuse the material that we've created in the past, both for from the relevance as well as from freshness, okay? So many times we end up creating, or most of the times we end up creating a fresh new deck that we want to present or a story that we want to present. When you take that, um, there is what we call marathon of the middle. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a term that is taken from people who write books but it's also as valid for people who make presentations or who are essentially going to talk about a topic, okay? 
how do you make it interesting when you are giving your speech? How do you make it relevant to people? How do you make it engaging for people who are listening to you? Okay. And that's where if you don't feel passionate about a topic, you will find it difficult to make it engaging, right? So that's why you need to choose a topic, a theme that you're absolutely passionate about, okay? The second thing is also identify micro-specific areas of comfort. You know, um, let's say, for example, if you were to take SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals of UN, right? There are 17 themes or topics. Now, even let's say, take, let's take gender inequality, right? What in gender inequality is your micro a you know specific areas of comfort comfort you know is it sort of early childhood girls education or is it gender diversity at workplace you know something that you feel comfortable with okay um so that's where you need to think about what is the area micro specific area that you feel comfortable okay third one is idea continuously bold and confident views Remember, you need to make sure that you are engaging your audience. Uh, I, a couple of slides back, I mentioned about thought provocation, right? You need to make sure that you're presenting bold and confident views, which are provoking thoughts um, uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, conjuring ideas, ideation amongst the, the audience, okay? And the last part is crystallize your unfair advantage. Why should people li listen to you? You know, what do you bring to the stage that others don't you know and this could be again through industry content industry expertise or engaging content thought leadership good oration whatever it is make sure that when you're drawing the line in the sand which is the first step is try and figure out what's your unfair advantage okay and these are some of the things i wish somebody had told me when i started my initial sort of speaker's journey okay uh, that you need to start casting these things in stone before you get started and and this will give you a good foundation um, of of how to be a speaker a good speaker second is choose your channel for brand building and when i say choose your channel meaning when you're going to promote yourself as a brand as a speaker you need to make sure that you have a multi or an omni channel approach right so which means that what are the platforms where people will see you? Now, 20 years back, 25 years back, a lot of it happened to be word of mouth uh, and, and, and the company, uh, the marquee company that you work for, okay? Uh, things have now changed, you know? Now we have new generation of celebrities or new generation of thought leaders that have not come from big company backgrounds uh, nor do they, uh, you know, come from, let's say, very formal experience. In fact, many of them are like millennials or their late 20s, early 30s, um, and, and yet they are thought leaders or considered thought leaders in their own spheres. So uh, the different channels where you're going to build your brands, you know, so LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever is there. How are you going to build your brand? And that's where people want to hear about your expertise. So we'll talk about white papers, articles, uh, people uh, talk about writing books. Um, also these days we have blogs, which are video logs um, and podcasts um, that, uh, that one needs to create. In parallel, we also talk about you know, self-promoted webinars, okay? So on one side, while you're preparing yourself to be a professional speaker, but you also need practice grounds, right? And, and webinars like these, uh, and I'm not saying this particular one, but I'm saying, you know, uh, uh, in a similar format could be a great way to start sharing your ideas, okay? So, you know, getting a webinar subscription and inviting your friends and family as a tryout saying, hey, you know what, I've got this great idea. Uh, why don't you guys come in and join my webinar? I want to just, you know, uh, practice my speech or practice my uh, my uh, my uh, uh, topic that I would be presenting, you know, uh, and that way you can actually figure out uh, ways where you're falling short on one side, but on the other side, it's also will help you in being able to give a good speech, you know. So start with self-promoted webinars. Have your friends and family and your colleagues join in um, um, some of these conferences. And and the last part is. Sometimes you'll have to pay, you know, and, and, you know, 
obviously you try and negotiate with the people involved, but you know, the lighter you are on the other side, i.e. Uh, the white papers, the blogs and the LinkedIn and the Twitters, the higher fees or the higher chances of paying a fee is there. But if you're, if you're more famous, if you are more known, if you've been writing stuff, if you've got tons of articles on LinkedIn or other blogs, you have to probably pay less uh, as, as fees or pr have a chance of getting a free entry or a wildcard entry. So, uh, but what is important is in today's world, you will have to use multiple channels and start promoting you as a brand, okay? So that's the uh, second stage. The third stage is essentially going to be on creating your own material, okay? And this could be in terms of um, uh, whether it's in, you know industry news, sorry, whether it can, in terms of um, uh, your own PowerPoint decks or white papers, etc. Now, how do you start getting ideas on what to write on or what to talk about, okay? And this is on the left-hand side of the page, you will see we talk about industry news. We talk about, you know, if you look at uh, different events, you can download those event brochures um, and this will give you a very good idea of what topics are people talking about, okay? Um, you could look at social media chats, LinkedIn groups, uh, Twitter, um, even Facebook in many cases uh, would talk about those. Um, another good source is market research, uh, whether it's the World Economic Forum, or, or uh, some of the consulting companies uh, share out their market research. Uh, so that's again, very um, good source of what to write on. And then last but not least is the expert interviews. And this is where these days we, you have blogs, video logs, um, you can subscribe to multiple channels, um, identify certain thought leaders. Um, what is important here is identify those thought leaders that resemble somebody that you want to become, okay? And, and this is again got to do with reflecting upon what kind of person you are. Um, so, so for example, if you see there are different kinds of, let's say, uh, speakers uh, that we see uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, on one side, you have somebody like Donald Trump, who's the president of the United States. Uh, then you have somebody like Bill Gates, uh, who's a social entrepreneur, but, but you also have people uh, who are running smaller businesses or people who are creating video logs on a regular basis. That could be food channels or entertainment channels or even work wise. Try and identify those speakers or thought leaders that closely resemble what you want to become you know, and, and follow their expert interviews uh, religiously to get ideas of how they're speaking, how they're getting their thoughts uh, put together and how they're uh, delivering the ideas, okay? So that's there on the, on the source of how do you get good ideas on what to speak about. On the right-hand side, we talk about, you know, the actual sort of mechanics, you know, you need to have ideation cards, you know. Um, typically, um, so this is something that I learned from a, 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 a colleague of mine, a business partner of mine. He said, why don't you create an ideation list that talks about 100 challenges in an industry, 100 challenges, you know, it's not 10, it's not five, it's 100, you know, and, and that point in time, when I did that for the first time, it was kind of, it was kind of refreshing on one side, but it was tedious, of course, you know, 100 challenges, uh, but it was refreshing. And part of the reason why it was refreshing is because after your first 10 or 15, you start running out of ideas. And that's when your brain starts opening up and say, what else, what else, you know, um, so ideation cards, you know, those listings are extremely helpful. Okay. Then once you're done with that, once you've got the list of topics that you may want to talk about, you start looking at the micro specific um, areas on, 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 uh, at the subtopic level. And this is where you start creating a storyboard. Okay. And typically the way I do it is I would put a header to a PowerPoint page and then I would put one or two or three comments saying, what would I want to cover in this page? That's kind of a storyboard uh, that is there. In order to test your ideas, you start publishing and writing uh, blogs and posts, you know, um, because this is where you want to start testing your speech ideas with others, okay? I'm gonna pause here again and see if there are any questions uh, before I do the final two stages. Okay. 
Well, just out of curiosity, yeah. how long did it take you to put together 100 challenges for the industry? Um, very, very good question. Um, so uh, normally you would be able to get, on the first day when you're writing it, you'll be able to get between 20 and 30 challenges quickly, okay? The first, let's say 50, 60, would come in about three, four days. The last 50 or 40 or 30 uh, can take you up to a month, the whole exercise. And did I understand it right that for each of the challenges, then you would add it to the PowerPoint slide and you would add two or three uh, different um, arguments that you would like to discuss for each of them? Yeah, uh, very good question. So the, the, um, the 100 challenges, it's for the ideation, right? What you do is when you create a speech, you would probably pick up only a handful of those challenges and bring it to your uh, your uh, speech because um, the idea is you know if you take too many challenges uh, your story becomes inconsistent so maybe uh, let's say uh, there are certain challenges that are linked to leadership styles okay so you bring in a few of those challenges maybe four maybe five um, and bring them together and cluster them in, in leadership and then you create your uh, speech around that you know uh, but these hundred challenges are not for one speech, but for multiple speeches. Okay, so it's always a good understanding of what you can bring in. But most importantly, these hundred challenges also make you think through the topic, and that's kind of also brings you or makes you a better thought leader because you have actually thought through many of these areas, and when you start promoting or when you start putting some ideas or some solutions together, what you'll find is many of these challenges are interlinked. And, and that's where this insights that you create by going through those hundred challenges, make it easier for you to put in a good solution that also is relevant to the, um, uh, to the audience. And most importantly, when people ask you questions, because you've gone through those hundred challenges and even some of the curveball questions, you are in a position to answer. Okay. Okay. Well, I think I think that this conversation, what you're sharing, is already getting the juices flowing in the head. Thinking, okay, I'll let you continue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, you know as as Massimo wrote, uh, almost a mind map. The answer is yes. Um, the hundred challenges. Um, uh, and, and I've seen, I've also been using a mind map. So mind map is good when it comes to, let's say, um, when you have 10, 12 main themes, and then you kind of start breaking it down into multiple points. If you go and follow it like that, yes, then you can go up to sort of 100. Uh, but sometimes people just want to randomly uh, bring in um, and uh, start putting the challenges together. So, um, but there are similarities and overlap between a mind map and uh, 100 challenges, 101 challenges, yeah. Um, anybody else, you know, um, um, uh, if uh, any reflection or any other thing that you would like to I share? Do. Hi. Yes. Okay, so I have a company called Life of Emerald and within it, Global Healing Movement 2020 is advocating for mental health, right? Yeah. And so looking at the circle outside is Life of Emerald, and inside is Global Healing Movement. Yeah. Now, because of the current challenges in the world, I've strategically placed the Global Healing Movement first, my mm -hmm. priority, um, shedding stigma, right? Yeah. But because, it's be, it, because it is inside of Life of Emerald, yeah. um, and my philosophy is that um, mental health is the, the culprit is not the mental health, but it's a whole systematic, um, you know, issue. Yeah. issues. Yeah. So in your opinion, is it strategically wise to focus on building a brand using global healing movement first this year? And in 2021, I can um, start focusing on life of Emerald, which encompasses visiting ancient sites to connect, you know, bringing the spirituality, ancient knowledge into the world. Right. So if I were to understand your question correctly, 
uh, what you're asking about personal brand building versus the company that you work with, work for, or you um, uh, you are the leader of uh, the brand of that company, uh, and and how how do people sort of take it in and kind of weave it? I mean, is is that my understanding correct, Kate? The, um, so Life of Emerald is a brand. Yeah. Bohemian movement is a brand under Life of Emerald. Yeah. So looking at long, longer term, starting mm -hmm. this year in 2021, yeah. I want to make sure that by advocating for global healing movement this year, mm -hmm. that um, I ha would have a smooth transition into Life of Emerald. So there's a, there's a congruence. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so it, it's, um, you know, I think that's a fantastic question. So um, um, you've got a brand which sits under Life of Emerald. Um, and uh, and then what you see is this uh, global brand uh, would somehow kind of um, build into or segue into your the Life of Emerald brand in, in the next year or two. Um, and, uh, and how does that work? Yeah. Uh, will that be okay? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, a brilliant question, Kay. You know, um, so there it depends. There are no straightforward um, answers for that, but let me give you a perspective, okay? Um, so uh, when it comes to brands, and I'm going to first use an analogy uh, from large companies, okay? So on one side, when we talk about, let's say, when we talk about, um, uh, let me take GE as an example, right? So. Um, there is there used to be GE Capital, GE Plastics, GE Healthcare, GE Energy. You know there was always GE. You know even even Baker Hughes, which was uh, um, one of the recent ones. Uh, it was a, a joint collaboration or joint venture between Baker Hughes and GE. Uh, but the way it got advertised was Baker Hughes, a GE company. You know the first company that I worked with um, was TIP Capital. It was in you know, the way it was branded was TIP, a GE Capital company, right? So. GE was uh, always at forefront of um, the logos, right, um, or the brand. Um, then you have a company where uh, they have Otis lifts, they have carrier air conditioner, uh, they have Sikorsky helicopters, um, which are in their own right famous brands. But if you look at the company that actually owns them is United Technologies, but not a lot of people are familiar with that. Okay. And then you have um, uh, Procter & Gamble, you know, Procter & Gamble itself is a very famous brand. Um, and uh, there's, there's a brand of, uh, of, um, uh, of lotion called Oil of Olay. Okay. Oil of Olay is a famous brand in itself. Okay, so you have both the company brand as well as uh, the individual product brand. Brand. The same thing with Reckitt Ben Geyser. You know, famous as as a, a company, but Detol, which is one of their most famous brands, um, you know, have, has its own recognition in the market. So it depends on the kind of brand um, uh, strategy that you want to follow. Now, in your specific case, and I, again, I don't know enough details. In your specific case, what you must make sure, and especially this is a dilemma that a lot of smaller companies face, is you have one company which has another mother company, and uh, to put it all together, there is also an individual, you know, like somebody like UK. Okay, um, what we find is there is always a bit of a challenge, a bit of a, 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 a you know, a, a, the lines are not that sharp between. Uh, the different brands, okay? And which is why it is important that when you're building a brand of you as an individual thought leader versus your company, which is expert in certain areas, provides business solutions in certain areas versus the other company, the difference should be clear from a brand perspective for all the three entities. Because otherwise, people will perceive you interchangeably. Okay, and that's something that I've seen several companies kind of uh, uh, struggle with, where is there's an individual brand versus um, 
versus the uh, brand of one company versus the brand of another company. And when I talk about brand, it is not just logos. It is what's the brand promise that the company stands for? What's the area of expertise? What would people, when they think about life of Emerald, what should they, what should, uh, you know, what should they be thinking about? What should they be expecting from the company? So those are the kind of things that you have to be very, very clear or from a brand perspective that it you kill, you've created a certain understanding, a certain, uh, you've all, you've documented what it stands for. What's the brand promise? You know, what are you telling the world that your company is all about? Okay, it's a, uh, you know, uh, a winded way of uh, answering your question, but I think uh, giving some examples would have helped you. Kate? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Any other question? Okay, so now let me go to the uh, step four and step five, which is building visibility is step four, and then we will talk about um, step five, okay? So this is where we start talking about, you've done the preparation, you've decided what topics that you want to speak about, uh, you've identified micro-specific areas that you feel comfortable with, you feel confident with, You've also figured out the unfair advantage, why people should listen to you, okay? And by the way, the thing that I've not mentioned is there are certain challenges that uh, one would face when, um, when starting or going through this journey as a speaker. One of them is stage fright, you know, and there are ways uh, that you can overcome stage fright. Um, the second one is um, the style of oration. Uh, and also there are ways for um, oration. And the third one is known as the impost, imposter syndrome, okay? Um, many people think uh, that because they're not the thought leaders, therefore they are not eligible to become a speaker. And the answer couldn't be further away, okay? The thing is, the moment you know something about something, you become eligible as a speaker. And one of the best examples is, if you look at schools, right, you'll always find there are certain people in grade four who would know more than the grade three people. So grade four student will be able to talk about something that the grade three person does not know, right? And use that, you know, use your opinion, use your uh, let's understanding and portray your opinion, portray your thoughts to the world, you know? Um, so don't be afraid of being seen as an imposter, you know, just make sure that you've studied your subject well. You don't have to be at the top of the thought leadership, but you need to have a good understanding of, of the expertise that, that, that is required. So keep that in mind. These are probably topics for another uh, webinar some other day. Um, but I thought, uh, you know, when I was on this page, I thought I'll share them with you. Okay, so anyways, bringing, building your uh, uh, visibility, publish posts consistently, okay? Um, and what I've seen is that um, even from my own experience, okay? So I do publish posts every now and then. Um, and what I see is if there's a gap between the period where I posted something on LinkedIn, for example, versus when I publish more often, okay? So whenever there is a gap, my LinkedIn followership goes down, okay? Versus whenever I start publishing posts on LinkedIn on a regular basis, I see people are noticing me more, people are commenting on my um, subjects or my topics or my thoughts. Um, so so that's, that's something that you need to make sure is not only publish, but publish consistently, okay? The next one is speak at events, okay? And this is sometimes you have to pay, but try and see if there are opportunities where you can actually speak for free, you know? Uh, there are people, especially uh, for events, that are newly started, okay? Um, so the event organizers also are looking for speakers uh, to fill in the uh, speaker slot, you know, because um, um, there are, um, you know, it takes effort to get, good speakers on board and sometimes they will just look for uh, speakers, new speakers coming in um, without much uh, vintage behind them. So this is a good opportunity. Um, also make sure that if you know some of these speaker groups, tell them, hey, listen, you know, 
I know this is this event is on let's say 4th of June okay and if you have any dropouts um, on the 4th of June here is the uh, deck presentation deck I can fill in the last minute okay that's a great way of getting a freebie speaker slot because because trust me even uh, you know even some of the uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a small or a large event conference people drop out even on the last day speakers and that's why um, you know uh, the event organizers struggle with that so this is a good opportunity to kind of put a foot in the door for you okay give opinions okay and the way you would give opinions would be uh, when somebody's on the stage uh, and speaking and talking about uh, a certain topic where they ask you questions not only ask the questions but also uh, give opinion provide a reflection saying yeah okay i heard this from you but here is a different angle to look at this okay that makes you get noticed i have used it in my early stages i've used it extensively to kind of create a brand for me okay share relevant anecdotes people always love examples when you're talking about methodology when you're even when you're talking about dry subjects the moment you start giving narrating examples from your personal experience it strikes a chord with your audience so make sure that you uh, have um, personal anecdotes personal experiences examples that you share okay never ever compromise on quality creating powerpoint deck is a rigorous exercise so you may actually have to go through it you know two or three or four times before it's ready for a speech okay don't think that you can create a powerpoint deck on the day of the presentation and still wing it you know you will struggle so make sure that you have at least prepared the first draft a week up front and then sleep over it think over it you know strategic intuition will start coming in and you'll say hey you know what i actually forgot about including that comment here even the one that you see was produced the at the final set or, or the uh, the first set was produced about five days back and then over the last few days i've been thinking about what else what else what can i change what can i say what can i make it uh, you know uh, to make it more effective what can i do so those are the kind of things that you need to think about okay so this is what you do to gain visibility uh, which is by doing your own stuff you know sharing speaking publishing etc on the other side another great way in digital age to do is comment on other people's um, um, posts you know in LinkedIn or on Facebook or any other channel that you use share and reshare your know, tweets but make sure that you've always added your own opinion okay I've seen so many people times people just blindly share without putting any comments of their own you know it, most of the people uh, unless the original content is attractive enough most of the people would not consider you as a thought leader or as an industry expert. They'll see you as somebody who liked an article and just sharing it. Okay. But the moment you start putting in your own views, your own opinion, it creates a much better impression in the market and creates a better visibility. Okay. And then um, this is again at the conferences or at coffee machines or whatever share views about a topic that you may have heard at a conference. Okay. So, um, kind of how do you increase your visibility kind of how do you increase um, um, the fact that people should start perceiving you as a thought leader or as an industry expert but make sure that you're not seen as somebody who's trying to desperately sell their wares okay and this is where uh, you know back to Massimo's question which was around um, um, you know sponsors and their content um, you know people don't like to be these days don't like to be sold to they would want to hear ideas they want to hear opinions they want to hear thought provocation um, elements points but they don't want to be sold to in most of the cases unless they explicitly ask you so uh, when you are pitching yourself when you're talking about your ideas um, make sure that you get good visibility but don't desperately try to sell yourself okay and then we get into so now once you've started doing this and this is an exercise that's probably going to take you a couple of years um, um, and uh, you know this is where you start getting recognized as a speaker etc um, but um, 
the stage five is something or the step five is something uh, majority of the speakers don't get to. Okay. And this is where, while you may get invited as a speaker once or twice, but if you really want to get repeatedly invited as a speaker, then step five is the one that you need to have. And that's creating your own X factor. Okay. And this is where it goes to uh, the question of brands. Okay. Remember, we started about, we started talking about you as a brand. Okay. How are you promoting yourself? as a brand because when people are inviting you unless you represent a big marquee company people are not going to invite you as a speaker for the company that you work for or the work with people are going to invite you for you okay so um, let's say for example in this case kate kate you may get invited as you uh, uh, who is an expert in certain field more than you may get invited as uh, life of emerald you know and and again i'm not saying that it's going to happen in your case but just to articulate the example um, people are talking about you as a brand when they think about uh, uh, being invited as a speaker on the other side advisory they may ask your company to come in and advise but when it comes to speaker because it's an individual thing you need to make sure that um, it's you brand that you're creating and you're creating through multiple channels okay but what does your brand promise? You know, if I were to invite, uh, let's say Sandra or say Pascal uh, to an event, what would I expect them as a speaker? And and when it comes to the creating X factor, you've already been seen as somebody who is a good orator, who is a good speaker, right? But here, when they invite you, what do they? what do they see as the brand promise okay in, in my case i get invited as somebody who has a good understanding of certain areas uh, or, or certain you know areas of um, knowledge or or certain functions um, uh, that i can speak about i can give lateral perspectives that's another element of my brand but more importantly they see me as an engaging person you know that i'm able to engage with the audience connect with the audience and uh, able to have a good conversation so that's kind of my brand promise and i'm not saying i'm the kind of i have all the x factor required but this is the kind of brand promise which is there and that kind of it goes into uh, what do you want to be known as okay so uh, interchangeably they can be used the next point is you need to create an image style, okay? Do you want to be seen as somebody like Steve Jobs with a, a purple neck sweater and jeans? Or do you want to be seen as somebody who's more formal, wearing business suits, you know? The same thing, uh, you know, uh, would be with ladies. Do you want to be seen in black or gray? Or do you want to be seen in color? Um, do you want to be seen as somebody who's flamboyant on the stage? Or do you want to be seen as somebody who's conservative? So your image style the hairstyle the um the facial hair uh, the kind of dress that you wear the shoes uh, uh, even in some cases um, it's the color of your tie or the shirt you know all of those things build up your image this is extremely important when it comes to creating an X factor as a speaker, you can get away, but the moment you want to get repeatedly invited as a speaker, you need to work on an image style. Okay. The other thing is you should have, have developed the ability to speak without slides. Okay. Um, and this goes to the Ted and the TEDx talks. Many of them, you don't have any slides. You have the person standing on the stage, just talking through their own story. Okay. And, and that's the level of confidence uh, or that's the level of uh, expertise that you need to have when you have developed an X factor, okay? And last but not least, have the ability to hold the audience captive for the duration of your speech, you know? Um, even though there may be some points where the audience may get less interested versus some other points, but you're still able to hold an audience uh, captive for, uh, for this period of time, okay? So, summary, you know, and since I've just looking at the watch, we have kind of reaching, uh, we've kind of reached the end of my time slot. Uh, before I kind of summarize, any questions or thoughts or reflection at this stage? Uh, 
Uh, I have one question. Sure. Um, I, I don't know if it's relatable for you, but what if the, those opinions we write or we share, our unique ideas or our unique um, thing, you know, thought, and we find that people um, share it without uh, referring us, how do we react on that? Okay. Um, great question, Michael. Um, and in fact, this is a question that I'll have to answer from the, from my experience. Okay, um, and I'm not saying I have uh, I have all the answers or the right answer, but I'm just giving you my perspective on that one. Okay, there are two kinds of people on this planet. Okay, first are the kind of people uh, who believe that I have got finite wealth and finite wisdom. All right, and therefore. Uh, if somebody else is using my idea or using, uh, let's say, my thoughts or using my opinions and does not give credit to me, then my world uh, diminishes. Okay, so that's one thinking. The other side or the other uh, set of people are the people who believe uh, that this uh, this wealth of ideas is infinite or it continuously re keeps refilling, keeps refilling. Okay. And, and this is where what people people feel is that if I share, yes, there will be rotten people or there will be rotten apple, right? Where some of them will not give me credit for the ideas that I've shared, okay? But let's say out of 10 people, if there are two or three who do not give me credit, but at least there are other seven or eight who are giving me credit. And therefore, by sharing, I will be able to get better visibility, okay? So literally there are two sets of people and I'm not saying one are better than the others. I'm just saying there are two perspectives, okay? What I've seen in general is if you are a good thought leader, if you are an industry expert, what people cannot take away from you is your own expertise and your own experience. And it, it has a way of coming out, you know. So even though somebody else may have stolen an idea from you and have gone and uh, have not given credit to you, but somewhere or the other, your expertise and your experience is going to come out in some shape or form someday. So um, that would be my, 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 my reflection on that question. But great question, Michael. Um, if I may just build on that question by Michael, and sure. I, I like I, I like your answer very much. I mean, it's a very um, solid approach to you know very wise. Uh, uh, is it um, would it be appropriate if you see somebody quoting you without actually sharing the credit to the original thought that you shared? Uh, would it be appropriate to then whenever you present yourself or you know in some other post? to say, I've been quoted by so-and-so and these people, you know, you know, so you basically use the fact that they used your idea uh, in your own favor, but backwards. Does it make sense? Cool, okay. So I guess uh, Michael may be on mute. Uh... But uh, yeah, there's there's a question that's been put by Pascal. Um, so how does Twitter fit in with all of this, right? Um, great question. Um, as I said, if you remember, uh, we talked about multi-channel versus omni-channel, okay? Um, what I've seen is um, one of the ways to create visibility uh, has been, uh, in the professional world, has been through Twitter, okay? And the reason for that is um, when you have to publish something on LinkedIn, it has to be, people expect longer thoughts, articles, white papers, blogs, etc. cetera. On, on, on Twitter, you can literally, at the spur of the moment, say, hey, you know what, it's a beautiful day, and I think of, um, uh, I think of something, okay? Uh, and that's a tweet. Now, 140 characters, 144 characters, and I think it's doubled. Um, you can tweet. What I would suggest is it's Twitter is um, an, accompan an accompaniment um, along with your other channels like LinkedIn or white papers. Okay. Uh, Twitter is, some, is, is, is a place where you can do a lot more, uh, let's say, postings compared to uh, some of the other channels. Okay. 
Um, so it's great for visibility. It's also great for sharing um, short, snappy ideas. Um, but if that's the only channel that you have, it may be a struggle there. Okay. So, so, uh, but I would definitely say if you are a professional person in professional individual, you must have a Twitter handle. You know, that would be absolutely like, like you must have a LinkedIn post uh, or a LinkedIn platform. You also must have a Twitter. That's when people will recognize you as a thought leader. You can be an industry expert and not have a Twitter handle. That's fine. But as a thought leader, people do expect you to be on Twitter. Great question. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, that's that's a that's a, a great point. Um, you know, and that's what the X factor is all about, right? Which is ability to uh, talk without slides and uh, keep ability to keep the attention of you know of the audience to keep them captive, mesmerized with what you have to say, uh, is definitely key. That makes uh, that differentiate between great speakers and good speakers. Okay. So with that, I'm just going to quickly summarize uh, what I have to what I shared today. Uh, first, start. Discover your compelling reason first. Why do you want to become a speaker? You know, uh, this is a journey that will need effort, time, dedication, uh, as well as research and analytics. Um, um, so therefore, you have to figure out why do you want to be a speaker, and then why do you want to be um, why do you want to you know uh, speak on a certain topic? What, why do you feel so passionate about those things? Okay. Um, uh, and the second thing is understand events perspective, right? When events, industry events, conferences, seminars, uh, those things happen, it's not just for sharing ideas, but there are, there are people, sets of people who have, who are running it as a business. So they need to make money somewhere. And therefore, if you're not known as a speaker, you're, you will likely to, uh, you likely um, be, have to buy your way in as a speaker at the initial stages. And once you get your name, floating around, it becomes a lot easier to get invited uh, as a speaker. For to be, to be invited as a paid speaker is a different ball game. And what I've seen is about 10 to 20% of the people in stage four get paid for uh, their, their, uh, uh, th those events. And when I say 10 to 20%, meaning I'm not talking about the travel and expenses, I'm talking about paid for the speech. Whereas 70 to 80 percent and, and the number can go up is when you have an X factor, that's when you start getting paid serious amounts of money. OK, so understand events perspective and and uh, and see how what stage you are in at the initial stages, you have to buy. Uh, but at later stages, you may start getting invited for free. And then when you become a superstar, you get um, you get invited and get paid for it. There are no shortcuts. This is a journey that requires a lot of effort, a lot of time, dedication, and practice, practice, practice. So, so that's how um, you know you need to uh, think about this endeavor. You know, and then I talked about the five-step process, drawing a line in the sand, we'll identify the topic that you want, feel passionate about, micro-specific areas, your unfair advantages. Um, then start preparing, building your brand. If this is your brand, the you in you, uh, who's going to be promoted as a speaker. Uh, create your material. And this could be PowerPoint decks. This could be um, uh, white papers, blogs, whatever. Start creating your material and then start posting them on a regular basis consistently. Uh, um, put comments on other people's uh, posts, uh, share, reshare. Uh, put opinion, all of that stuff, so that starts building visibility. Be seen um, at at different conferences, but don't overly sell yourself. Okay, for balance, keep the balance between you being seen seen as a, a thought leader versus um, versus um, uh, somebody who's trying to sell their wear. Okay, and and the last one is creating the X factor, you know, which is essentially working on your brand, the brand promise, etc. So. That is kind of um, what I have to share today. So if um, uh, you want to dive deeper, uh, you can contact me at anirvan at fifthchrome.com uh, and we can have a half an hour session and discuss it some more. Um, meanwhile, um, I would like to thank uh, 
Julia and Massimo uh, for uh, and and the altar contacts uh, members of the altar contacts to uh, have created this event um, and uh, yeah if there's if there's time for another one or two questions more than happy to take them right now any questions Comments? I, I, I see that there is a discussion going on on the chat, but it's not anything uh, question related. Yeah. So um, I would like to, to thank Amirman for this very, very interesting talk. I mean, that was a very good example of what you're preaching. And I think um, in every slide, in every part of the talk, we've learned a lot. I mean, I've been taking notes the whole time. So hopefully that will really help all of us to move ahead in, in what we aspire to do. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much for joining us today. So, thank you, and wishing you guys all the best. Thank you very much.